of my technical planning staff to present an overview briefing that will serve to, uh, to put the, the subject on, a, on what we hope will be a firm and understandable basis. And after that, then we'll take up uh, uh, the three items you've indicated. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, we've already given you uh, co paper copies of the view graphs that we'll be using. Mindful of the provisions of Section 303G of the Communications Act to study new uses for radio and encourage larger and more efficient use of radio in the public interest, the technical planning staff of the Office of Science and Technology has been working for over a year in cooperation with other bureaus and offices to explore new opportunities created by this new type of radio technology called spread spectrum. Next. Spread spectrum was originally developed for military applications where there was an interest in either covert communications or resistance to jamming. Because our current rules emphasize specific enumerations of allowed modulation types, we implicitly forbid this new modulation type. And we feel this prohibition may be inhibiting R&D in the civil sector, as may be noted by the fact that in the past five years, we've only received five applications under uh, the experimental radio service <coughs> for spread spectrum-like technologies. Spread spectrum systems basically work by combining an information signal with a much wider bandwidth noise-like signal and transmitting the combination. At the receiver, we must have an exact copy of the noise-like signal. And given this exact copy, we're able to combine it with a transmitted signal to, to derive the original information that we desire to send. We use one block diagram in trying to explain this briefly. At the transmitter at the left, we have an information signal which is coming in. Below it, we generate a wideband signal. And we have a duplicate wideband signal generator at the receiver, which generates a replica. After doing this mixing at the transmitter, we then, sent, we then change the frequency up to some convenient authorized center frequency for transmission over the antenna. At the receiver, we receive it, translate it down to a convenient intermediate frequency for processing, mix it with the wideband replica, again, an exact copy of what was used at the transmitter, deriving the information signal. There are two basic methodologies we're using for doing this. Next view graph. The first, which we'll deal with, is called frequency hopping. This effectively works by changing the transmitter frequency several times a second and simultaneously changing the frequency of the receiver in exact synchronism. With this technique, one can cover a very wide bandwidth, have tight control on, on the actual frequency which is used, and can even miss selected frequencies in a block of, of frequencies. With this type of system, adjacent users in the same area only interfere with each other when they instantaneously use the same frequency and do not interfere with each other at other times. A characteristic of this system is that only moderate accuracy is needed in synchronization between transmitter and receiver, typically a tenth to a hundredth of a second. Next. Direct sequence pseudo noise, or PN, is a more complicated system in which the wideband signal consists of a sequence from a cryptographic-like key generator. This sequence is combined with the communication signal, which is then transmitted at the carrier frequency. In such a system, the receiver key generator must be synchronized to the transmitters very accurately, typically less than a microsecond. Next. Spread spectrum has several characteristics that look interesting for civil use. First is interference suppression, indeed a major motivation for the original military work. Uh, in this characteristic, the strength of interfering signals is reduced by a factor called the processing gain, which can be as high as 10,000. This also leads to applications involving resistance to jamming and other types of mutual interference, and can be very helpful in severe multipath environment, that is, where reflections off buildings or terrain interfere with the desired signal. Another characteristic of spread spectrum allows us to use energy density reduction. That is, the processing gain I previously mentioned allows a reduction in the power density, the number of watts per hertz. This led to originally to applications involving covert communications, but also can lead to applications with low interference to other independent users and privacy. Next. Another application of spread spectrum would be involving uncoordinated channel sharing. In certain cases, spread spectrum users can share a common frequency block without the explicit coordination that we need in, in either trunking systems, time division multiple access, or frequency division multiple access, the common 
uh, technique we use today in which each user is given independent frequency and shares it among only with himself. Spread spectrum can be helpful in applications involving ranging or time delay measurement, as the uncertainty in measuring the arrival time of a signal or reflection off a moving object is inversely proportional to the bandwidth of a signal. Wide bandwidth signals can be measured very, very accurately as to when they arrive. This leads to applications involving high accuracy radars, and indeed combined with the low power density I mentioned previously, may lead to applications in police radars that might make them difficult to uh, detect using fuzzbuster type technology. Next. We've looked at a variety of, of civilian spread spectrum applications, and indeed in more detail of this is contained within a commission funded study that was performed by the MITRE Corporation for us. One involves uncoordinated sharing of spectrum allocation, sometimes called code division multiple access. We feel this may be more efficient than trunking or fixed channel assignments in certain environments involving a low density of users. It would not require any explicit coordination among the users and has the interesting characteristic that the quality of service degrades gradually as number of instantaneous users increases. That is, we don't suddenly run out of channels as we do in the current spectrum allocation technique. So there may be some applications where this might be useful. Spread spectrum could also result in the creation of a very large number of apparent channels as opposed to physical channels. This number could be much greater than the, than the underlying physical channels that we allocated and might be used, for example, in a new citizen's band allocation to restore it to its originally intended use. Next. Spread spectrum might be used as overlays on spectrum used by conventional services. The low power density aspect of spread spectrum would allow us to have a share of the same spectrum in cases of short range communications. One area which we've been exploring in this is the cordless phone area, which is intrinsically a short-range communication service. Finally, it might be useful for privacy for law enforcement communications. It would, in this application, it could provide both encryption-like security and transmissions that are difficult to detect with conventional radios. We note that federal law enforcement agencies are already allowed under IRAC or authorization this type of technology, although non-federal law enforcement agencies are implicitly forbidden. <coughs> 